Wow. That's wow. Exciting. How nice is that? It's beautiful. Yeah. Well, welcome everyone. I'm still People are like, tacos. what's going on in here? Right. Um, and this is a session on the notes method. It is my brainchild and very much inspired by kind of the way I think and also many interactions I've, been, I've had with my own students over the past eight years. I've taught in many different settings. I've taught privately different types of instruments, piano, violin, viola, cello, voice, um, and composition and theory tutoring. I've uh, tutored at the undergraduate level and also taught at the undergraduate level at Wagner College for two years. I did intro to music technology, I did treble choir um, directing, I did string ensemble directing, I always accommodated my classroom and I did many multiple types of things. I love doing those things and I'm here to serve you. And you're here to serve your students, of course. So I would like to tell you a little bit about the notes method. The what? In her article, Visual Spatial Learners, Linda Krieger Silverman states that success in the 21st century depends on grasping the big picture, multi-dimensional perception, problem finding, visualization, thinking outside the box, and especially creativity. That's really the star one for me. The notes method aims to improve these skills along with creative thinking. In this presentation, I explore the pedagogical benefits of teaching the foundations of music theory using an original method I've called the notes method, silent G like gnomes, which utilizes practical and creative tools that merge visual spatial with auditory sequential learning and emphasize perceptual training. Now, typically in classrooms, we do auditory sequential learning, um, but only about 30% of the population is an auditory sequential learner. Even though we're all multiple types of learning, we'll get to that later, multiple types of learners. So there are other folks in the classroom, like me growing up, that was highly gifted and yet really didn't pick up on things as quickly. Sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't, and I felt real stupid sometimes. I could play you back a song that I heard, but then I felt like I sucked at theory. I didn't feel like I was good at theory through college. And I took music theory one three times, didn't do well, didn't test take well. And I'm like, well, how is this possible? I thought there was something wrong with me, right? But there wasn't. It was just, I learned differently than sort of a neurodivergent way or not in the neurotypical way. And I discovered that later as I was going through my teacher training when I was learning about special needs, special students, different types of learning, and I said, oh my gosh, that's me, that's me, that's me. <laughs> and I'm like, I feel seen. And I want others to feel seen in your classroom. So, um, it utilizes my method, practical and creative tools that merge those two things. The method is constructivist. So, it, you construct things together, you build, you discover, kind of like Legos, like the Lego building blocks of music. Um, and then it's applicable to multiple types of learners. So if you help some, you can help others. One time in, in a class I was in for special learners, so I forget who our presenter was, but she was phenomenal. And she said, if you make something that meets the needs of a special type of learner, it will meet the needs of all. You mm -hmm. bet that having more margin space would serve all. Having a color system might serve all. So even though it helps those different types of learners, it helps everyone. They just get used to seeing that. We've created an environment that is a little bit more inclusive for all types of learners. So we want to converge those multiple aspects of music learning into the music making and music learning process. There is a need. There's still a need for explicit theories of music reading that would organize knowledge and research about music reading into a system of assumptions, principles, and procedures. Sounds very scientific, right? Okay. Well, it kind of is. Such theories would be useful in predicting and explaining the phenomenon of music reading. Now, I got this research from Suzanne Burton's Making Music Mind, the development of rhythmic literacy. So we're talking about the development of reading literacy, however, I would like to expand that into multi-literacy because it goes beyond reading, okay? So such theories, 
I think would also be useful in developing teaching methods that cultivate music literacy and creative thinking in learners. It comes from the creative process. This existing need is at the core of the notes methods why. So the why. These skills, we'll go back to those success in the 21st century skills, right? They're all, they all require active and creative cognition. Now this is a word that's been floating around in academia a lot lately. Music cognition, but in general, cognition. We're learning more about the brain um, a lot now. We're very interested in how the brain functions. We're interested in how we learn, how we memorize, what is memory, different types of memory, and all of that's interconnected. And I really like staying plugged into that aspect of research, and I'm very inspired by music cognition research and um, psychology and uh, a lot of brain research of all types, of all types. So kind of scientific on that side of things. So when it comes to music theory, such ways of thinking are often elusive to students in the formative years of their music education, and they're not developed until much later, if ever. But that takes too much time, and we might lose them by then, right? Any skill which requires cognitive maturity takes the time to be developed. And this is especially true for learning to apply these above skills in music in order to become literate and autonomous, as we define it now. However, maybe we re need to redefine what being musically literate is. Maybe it's not just performing. Really, at the core of it, it's communicating our ideas with another through a sound craft. Let's, open, let's expand that definition a little bit. But when time is of the essence, how can teachers and learners get the best head start? Also, teaching music theory and practice is vastly diverse across different instruments and learning environments in the US. So how do we maximize this type of skill learning across such a diverse spectrum? As Tom said over here, there is no strings program in this school, right? So, so our kids are only getting a piece of the puzzle, and such a small piece that they didn't really get the time to discover how connected music is to everything else. We have, and this might be really helpful with administration, to integrate and to advocate for music in our schools that, look, music might be the glue we're looking for. We teach it in this particular way, maybe in this revised new way, to, be applied and to help with other STEM disciplines as well. We'll get to that. So here's an example. Often students studying piano have the most advantage learning music theory, let's say music theory in practice, due to the visual layout of the keyboard and access to an instrument which is both harmonic and melodic. Mm. Great. But as we approach secondary music education, even at the collegiate level, Many students are expected to have a certain level of music theory understanding across the board and are required to have or gain a certain level of keyboard proficiency. But how many of us in our schools actually teach keyboard? We're teaching trumpet, we're teaching violin, we're teaching voice, choir. And then suddenly they get to college and they're like, take your basic keyboard proficiency class and it's back to the basic. Why? Why is this happening? Why are we doing it this way? So by the time students reach college in the US, they may have received radically different levels of music theory training, making it difficult for them and college programs to assimilate everyone's levels in their courses, even post pre-screening assessments, which in and of itself may be a lim limiting barrier to some, right? I've tutored many people saying, I have this intake assessment at my college. Can you help me review? I feel like I'm not good at theory. The last person I did that was applying to Curtis. Oh, wow. Right? We have a Curtis, someone applying to Curtis with an excellent voice who was like, I'm worried about this music theory exam, and they might not take me. And guess what? I had to take that exam too, and I wasn't that good at it. I really wasn't. So something maybe needs to change in the way we approach and integrate this music. Please. Stephanie, have you noticed that um, along uh, in colleges now that they're only teaching theory like one-sided. You know, I'm challenged right now because I'm teaching my whole sixth grade class, whole note, half note, quarter note, ta ta ta, ta whatever. But wondering why some kids are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Like, it's four beats, why don't you get that? But maybe 
I'm going to go away. I mean, you know what I mean? No, I don't think it's the wrong way, but perhaps there's a more expansive way. Okay. Right? I do think that in colleges, theory is still taught very traditionally. Right. But in general, we, we often teach the way we were taught. And I, I get asked so many questions. This really originated when I was in uh, the Olive Tree Music Studio teaching a brand new five-year-old who came in for a 15-minute lesson. I'm like, what am I going to do with that? Right? Yeah, right? Oh, and they're like, well, why is this that? And I was asked such these kid logic questions that are really deep. They want to know why. Why does it work this way? Why is that note that note? Why did it change? Why is it a different note on the second line when we get to that symbol? Like, what? And then we're like, oh, because that's just the way it is. You'll get it later. But the truth is, I didn't really have a good answer for that. So I needed to come up with one that made sense in kid logic and scaled up to all of the skills and the theory knowledge that we need to know anyway, right? So I found a way. So music literacy, let's say, is like digital literacy in the 21st century. We gotta get the kids and see them where they're at. Music is a spectrum of exponential knowledge and literacy skills, much like those required in the digital age today. If you didn't grow up with technology the way kids now are, we may struggle a little differently with some of the things that's like a breeze to them. It's because it's natural to them, because it's the environment they grew up in. So our music classrooms need to, the, our, the environment we create for our kids needs to change along with them. Then we won't feel such a big divide between why are kids so different today? Yeah. Because life goes on and they change and we have COVID and what happened, right? We, this is a way that maybe we can meet them a little bit more, meet their needs and connect with them. So think, if the average person just took one year of musical study, let's say at any age, pick an age, what would you want them to learn? I believe students should be able to participate, communicate, use, and create with some music language literacy beyond that single year of study. If they took music in fourth grade, by the time they get to college, will they be able to say anything? Will they be able to verbalize and have a conversation about music still? Or will they be that adult, um, sorry, will they be that adult that says, oh, well, I took one year of piano when I was little and then I, I don't know anything, I'm tone deaf. Oh my gosh, those, those comments invigorate me. I say, no, you're not. Wait a second. Why, how did we get to the point where you're an adult saying that? Let's fix that. Let's fix that starting at the beginning, starting with the fundamentals. Okay, so think about that question. If you only get one year with them, what do you really want them to learn? Is it really about the quarter note? Right? Is it really about meeting those standards? Yes, we'll meet the standards. But give them something that's so memorable that they'll be able to apply that one year of learning to some other aspect of their learning later on, to another discipline. If they go be an engineer, they'll be inspired by music, right? So on most instruments, one year of you know, study hardly results in mastery. So if the student doesn't have an immediate passion or talent for their instrument, aside from having a conditional environment that encourages or requires them to persist, they quit, quote unquote, quit music. And by the time they become adults, they consider themselves almost, if not entirely, musically illiterate, what we just talked about. So the can't, not good enough, I don't understand, I don't sound good mentality really kills a continued musical interest and eventually leaves people lacking literacy. Now I saw um, a session yesterday, so I included in this, uh, by Dr. Debbie Perdu uh, Januzzi. She was one of my theory, AP theory teachers at Sparta High School, and she gave a presentation about the joy in the, in the career, joy in learning. And she said, you know, she reminded me of the power of yet. Saying yet. I may not know this yet. I may not be good at this yet. But it's never impossible. It never is. And let's just get that yet learning quicker, <laughs> right? So it doesn't feel like, okay, you'll know it 10 years from now, 
No, set goals. You could learn this a month from now. How? Get them there. Help. And that goes for you guys, too. If you're struggling with anything, it's just yet. We're all a work in progress. Yes. I see that in um, with my stuff with art. Okay, last okay. time I took an art class, I, I, you know, how long ago was that, right? Right. I still draw the same way I draw like I was in fifth grade. Yes. Right? Because I never learned how to do it better. Yes. So you, wherever you end, when you come back to it, that's where you pick up to begin with. Right, but you have somewhere to begin from. Yeah. Right? So I like thinking about it this way. We have to maximize efficiency to minimize deficiencies. We really do. We have such limited time for core teaching in the classroom. In every type of lesson, but especially in public schools, there are so many external pressures. So little time. And classroom management and all of that. How much core learning is actually happening? And we've got to do it over and over and over again and expend your energy. And then Friday comes and you're like, oh my gosh, I was hit by a bus. Let's do this again next week. What did and they then do? We have some senior learners here, I mean, some senior teachers here who know. And I watch them and I see and I learn from them. Liz Perryman over there was my, my, I was her student teacher. And she has a wonderful classroom. Wonderful classroom, but oh my gosh, I don't know how she does it. Where the energy comes from to do all of the lessons with K through 12 and everything in between and lunch duty and all of the things, right? Okay, I wanna help you help yourselves and help your students. So if there's anything I can make for your classroom or there's a need or you need a lesson plan, let's work together and let's build something. I want this to get out there to other music educators and know that there's someone who's willing to help and make for them. I am here for you. So we know that doing helps learning and retention and brings meaning to learning, but how can we maximize the doing with theoretical retention? And I really am a music theory advocate, a music theory in practice advocate, not just learning how to play an instrument to a certain level, because theory is where it's at. If you understand that this, you know a piece of a big theory puzzle and it's all integrated, that's where you hold on to the inspiration. You may not remember exactly how to do it, but you remember it's a piece of a really giant puzzle and you knew that from the second grade, right? You knew that something clicked. So what are our true takeaway skills? Think about these questions. So the how, here's a couple ways. I use, in the notes method, color coding, imaginative note personification with the notes critters. <laughs> Silent G again, like gnomes, they, they look gnarly a little bit. So you, there's another one with, uh -huh. with a silent G, a little gnarly. I recently had a, a book publisher tell me that he thought they were ugly and that kids wouldn't connect with them. Oh. That's not what I hear from the kids. And I don't care if they're a little ugly because we all look different, so why can't they? That's fine with me. Fine. So geometric shape formation. Now shape and geometry is big really big in my method because if we can find a way to visualize it and shape it and how it connects to that larger shape of music theory and picture, then, then we might be able to understand a little bit better. Pattern discovery and recognition, congruent audiovisual training, composition, and play. Let's play in our classrooms. Let's get them doing playful things. And that keeps them engaged. So we can network music theory concepts in a logical and intuitive way, in ways that are constructivist, visually mechanical, and physically interactive for students. And those help develop music literacy and transferable skills. Lifelong Kindergarten. Now this is a book I read by Mitchell Resnick. He works in the MIT Media Lab. I applied there, they didn't take me. Maybe they'll watch this video and reconsider. Anyway. <laughs> The creative learning spiral is something I got from Mitchell Resnick. And if you've ever learned, uh, heard about the Scratch programming language, it's an open source programming language for fundamental learners, kids, but also adults, because I use it. You're learning about coding in an intuitive way in an open market, and you're communicating with other friends. Why don't we have this for music? Let's find a way to make this for music. So um, it offers these four Ps. I think I wrote that on the next slide, okay? Four Ps. Projects. People learn best 
When they're actively working on meaningful projects, generating new ideas, designing prototypes, refining um, iteratively. Let the kids do that. Let them make, let them build a song, help scaffold for them, right? But help, help them help themselves. Let them do the doing. Peers, learning flourishes as a social activity generally, even though we do have solitary learners, right? But they can use homework for that too. <laughs> like, let's get them integrated in the classroom. Um, so people share ideas, collaborate on projects, and building on one another's work. Have one kid start a song and have the next kid continue it. Then you have to work together. There needs to be continuity, but the kids are coming up with it as well. They're involved in the process. Passion. When people work on projects that they care about, they work longer and harder, like me. This is my whole passion project. I've been working on it for years, and I never get tired of it. So they persist in the face of challenges. They find those challenges, problem finding, and then they figure out how to problem solve. And they learn more in the process by doing that. We do that in the sciences. Create an experiment, learn how to create it, do the experiment, analyze it. Did it work? It didn't do it again. How do you revise? Why don't we learn that in science and not in music? Why is it any different? And play, the other big one I told you about, involves playful experimentation, trying new things, tinkering with materials, testing boundaries, taking risks, iterating again and again. Repetition is wonderful. Now, uh, Elizabeth Margulies over at Princeton in the Music Cognition Lab, she's doing a lot of research on music cognition and she's written about repetition in music. Now, I really am inspired by that. What types of repetition do we have? What types of repetition would be helpful? I think different types of repetition would be helpful. As we know, this seems obvious, but sometimes it's finding new ways to do that. More the how, learning about learning styles, which was the poster board we had up front. So this seven learning styles is an expanded form of Neil Fleming's 1987 VARC model, which is visual, auditory, read, write, and kinesthetic. Now this isn't a widely, fully agreed upon, there are seven learning styles in the academic, you know, we're, we don't all agree. However, I think it's a good launch point for you to learn more about learning styles and therefore more types of learners in your classroom. And most of us are multiple types of learning styles. So I'm gonna go grab that poster board now. Let's put the link on. No, I'll be okay. I'll do that in a second. So we can see the poster board. here looks like. So if we have more people, we can imagine that this might scale up. And I ask you, put a post-it not on one learning style, put it on all the learning styles that you think relate to you. So, yes. It's interesting that number is very mathematical. None of us put it up there. <laughs> you know? That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting that also you, yeah. Uh, yes. It only retains a little for me, like I'm more by the kids' side. But That's it's interesting. Still, it's logical. It's the mathematical oh, magical, magical. Yeah. Right, so this is the yeah. mathematical. Right. Isn't that funny? I would put, I should have put mine on here too. I would, right? I would, I would put I some on right. blue. Actually, I identify with all seven in different contexts. Yes. We are all some degree, some scale, some spectrum of all of these types. We just might have a preference for more, you know, certain ones. And so if we do different types of things in our classroom, we're trying to kind of get those preferences all covered. Well, and music helps me understand more math, so. There you go, the that's the point. One helps the other. So this is really highly integrated with memory. There's studies on learning styles and memory, and I'm very interested in that. Um, and I want us to just reflect on, on this being a small picture of a much wider world in our classrooms, yes. Um, Sandy, I play with um, a gentleman who has frontal lobe dementia, mm -hmm. and he's oh, wow. uh, 65 years old, and his music has, has stayed with him. I mean, we used to play gigs a lot, and but over the course, I mean, he can hardly walk now, and he can 
he just sits there. Right. Until he picks up his guitar and he's going to the G scale, we, we jam or something like that. And I've noticed that he's, he's losing that now, so I've tried to, he likes to just go like this. So I put my hands under him and we, I've connected with him where like we do eights. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and you turn it over, he does it. And then we're doing patty cake now. But I mean, it's like, I'm, I don't know what his learning style is anymore. Okay. I'm just at the point where. Right, he's but it's losing the final thing because you know, in the brain scan, his brain is uh, in the back is white, and your brain is white, wow. and your music is stored back here, huh. okay, right here. That is as white as can be, but right. active writing and memory is in the is frontal like a lobe, right? Spike. So, he's so, losing it all. So, it sounds to me like this particular student, um, or friend, uh, has is using his long term memory. And really can't access as easily, or you know, maybe uh, deficient in his active um, short-term memory, which is more frontal lobe. And we're constantly activating frontal lobe short-term memory style learning when we're first introducing stuff, and then we need to repeat it in multiple different ways in order to commit it to long-term memory. Right. Now, music is one of those things. I recommend um, the great courses on Audible has um, a series on music. Cognition research recent. It's quite recent. It was published like 2018 or something like that. So I've listened to the whole thing. It's very interesting, and it does talk about um, the brain and music and learning and, and what was the name of it? Uh, I'll find it on my Audible and give it to you later. It, it's from the, the Great Courses, and oh, okay. um, it's on music cognition. I think if you look that up, you'll find oh, it. Yes. Thank you. I want to respond. Please. Go ahead. Yes, yeah. well, at that moment, he was right on the same page. Yeah. I would keep doing that. You know, his yeah. wife was so excited because then she said, I don't know how to connect with anyone. And uh, he's, she's clapping with him, do which was kind of cool. Do you, do you uh, know anything therapy also? I'm, I'm not one. I'm a musician, but I'm just kind of learning it on my own. <laughs> you said it might be helpful if you... It's helpful. You can do, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. Yep, that's because awesome. Then they can all, yes, she's going to bring in the wife. The wife needs to be a part of it. Absolutely. Them. And then you're working together yep. with that. Touch can be huge. Yeah, huge for learning. Yeah. Touch, yeah. this is why I have this whole, we got to touch, we got to move things. And if we're used to, you know, touching our instrument, then we feel like, oh my gosh, rusty. Right? When you, there, there is a level of rusty depending on time away from your instrument. That's fine, but, um, the, the touch aspect is so much more important than we realize. Than we realize. Let's continue. Can someone please give me the time? I'm only It is 1.32. Excellent. So we know we're complex human beings. I may skip through a little bit of this quickly. So let's help your students learn about their own learning styles. I'd really like to develop a questionnaire or some activities where your students will learn about how they learn. Because I didn't learn how I learned until college, and it would have been helpful to yeah. know that earlier so that they know how to study, study and self-teach. We want to help them learn how to learn in all subjects. We got to be in on this as teachers together. Help your students learn how to learn, and then they can learn any subject, any area, and not feel like they can't. Yes, so you, the first thing you would do with the group is you would assess where they're coming from, and then you would Im implement the different notes? Is that how you would, how would you, it for depends, so I can learn how to implement it? Right, it depends on their needs. Um, for your, so say I'm a, a student who only learns by touch and tactile, what would so, you do with me? Yes, I would get different colored items in their hands okay. and have them move it around. So I move it around like on the staff, or would it be? You can do it on the staff. We can apply it to the staff, but you don't have to start with the staff. Let me show you something. I have plus plus up here. I've used this in private lessons, but you can do this bigger style because I know you use a lot of stuff. Um, let's say you have 
big squish balls. Actually, I found stress balls that I almost bought, but everything costs so much money. Um, but they had these seven different color stress balls, and I was like, we could make a game out of this. And you could gamify learning the notes with the colors through the stress balls. Yeah. Make a game out of it, like a pass the ball, or make a song, or so our, our fidget lo it. Our lovely you know? admin would say, what is your, what is your, what you, are you teaching? What's the wall? So we are learning that. What would I be learning? And then the activities that would follow. Well, what specifically would you be teaching me about musically? So you'd be learning color association for note name retention okay. and the basic building blocks of creating composing music. Because we move harmonically. Like rhythm, rhythmically or um, it can you can include rhythm in it, but harmonically speaking, if you're you're having a kid do C and then E, and then you switch them, that creates a different thing, a different sound. So they learn about like, like the yeah. intervals. Yeah, because we have to we have to be very fine at how we put what we learn, and then the activities are all right. It's diverse. quite open ended, but yeah. But what the core building blocks are there are create, um, composing, basically, on a very, very basic level. Because you have to remember, you have to know what color the note is. And then if you put them in a certain order, they're going to sound differently than if you put them in a different order. How do you, do you in, implement fixed or movable though with that then? That's, that's interesting. I would then say your do, C, is... Um, is, is like move them around so that yeah. you're basically doing transposing on the spot. Right. So the red is do instead of C. You can still do that. Okay, right. Yeah, I think you can. Yes? How do you avoid the, I heard it in another session, it wasn't here, but how do you avoid the danger of a child becoming too hooked, dependent on color? That's a good that? question. I've, I've been asked that question before. I have had some students quite dependent on color mm -hmm. and what I start to do is after everything being colorized, I start to remove one color at a time. Because then, for example, they're taking piano lessons or whatever. They're reading a piece of music and now all the G's, the blues, are gone. Now they, they know the one that's, that's gone yeah. was blue. That's the one that's missing. And they start to actually look at the note and where it is too. So they start to learn the black and white dot version of that. Mm -hmm. Then yeah, blue and yellow gets gone. Ooh. Now, which yeah. one's which? You start basic differentiation the other way around, rather than adding color. You could do it both ways. Mm -hmm. You could be like all black and white. Their own. They could right, they themselves. can do it on their own. It yeah. could be all black and white, and you add just one color. Like, color all the C's in your music, in your band music. Then, every time they get to a C, they're going to know they're going to have that as a permanent marker, as a marker. So you might not want to start with all the colors at once, depending on your level. Or do it the other way around if you're really working with the little ones. They start with the colors, they learn about how they kind of interact with each other, yeah. and then they start to go away. Yeah, that's great. Yes, Tom. I also, um, so I do a lot with color when, I, when I'm teaching recorder. Oh. Um, and so for our recorder concert, what I do is I have three or four different versions of all the music, and I put them in a folder on, on the stand. This way the student can choose, do I want Icon no notation where it tells me, you know, it's like uh, big circles that are blue that say G and have like, you know, uh, three dots so that they remember that mm -hmm. it's three. Or do they want regular notation but it's colorized? Or do they want just plain traditional notation? Because, you know, That's my, cool. my uh, students who want that enrichment, they're really proud. They're like, oh, Mr. Carl, I'm, I'm ah. using the real stuff. And then my students who can't do that yet. Um, they, they are. They can, participate. Right, they can participate, and nobody has to know. And this is classroom too, right? This is classroom. Yeah, right? that's okay. classroom yeah. too. But uh, they, it's a little bit less covert in the classroom because I have three piles of, of music, and I say, you know, you can choose whichever you feel comfortable with. But for the concert, I think it's pretty important that it's in all of the folders. This way, if somebody's been, you know, like kind of hiding the fact that they need that Colors. that um, mm -hmm. yeah that uh, scaffolding. That they're able to still be successful in the concert. Not the word nervous. Yeah. 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 I love the word scaffold yeah. too. It's so necessary because I learn so well when I feel like I'm scaffolded in a way that doesn't make me feel like I'm less than yeah. or yeah. failing. You cool. know? And it goes right within our, do you guys use SGOs? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it goes right within it. Like this all 
touches those each of those points that we have to do. Right. We want to serve our students and help them help themselves learn. Eventually, yet mm -hmm. they might not be at the at the point yet where they can just read the regular notation with in black and white. Right. But they will get there. Right. You. It, it does take a little bit of individualized attention. So it's incredibly important that we do assess different types of assessment, formative, summative, whatever. Um, to to find out that information periodically from about our students, but really I have found that if you're like integrating this, this style, you're gonna know. They help you know. Um, yeah. It's very expansive, and like I said, this isn't a fully developed idea. This will continue in its development with the help of other educators, of you guys trying out the color system, trying to use a, a manipulative that I've created. And if it doesn't work, why? Let's talk. Let's let's build this together. Yes. I also I also say like for people who are worried that they will become reliant on the colors, like there is a certain point in your musical development where like it would be so hard to, for example, read like you know chords that have like six or seven notes on them and look at all those colors and really understand. Yeah. It based on the color, especially... And that's doing... when we get to shape. Then we use shape. Yeah. Not... Okay, you have a you have a ninth chord. That's like yeah. tons of colors all on top of each other. What the heck is that? Wrong. No, it becomes... The whole point of the colors is it helps reveal patterns in geometric musical shape. Okay? that That's what we call the tonnets. If you've never heard that word, I believe in teaching with the tonnets. Check it out on the is website. That, is, that a, is that your? It's a real thing. No, it's what the, is it? The tonnets is um, basically a diagram that connects um, that connects triadic harmony together. Okay, and so it's an actual theory. Yes, and I'm I'm expanding on it because my tonnets is a little bit different than the tonnets that have tonnets with an e that has come before me. They've only really been used in like postgraduate collegial level whatever mm -hmm. theorizing. I'm like, this thing, I came up with this and I didn't know it existed until I found out I invented something that already existed, but <laughs> mine was different. Mine retained intervallic distance That's in cool. a way the other ones didn't. They were equilateral tri triangles, mine aren't. It's a geometry. So it, it turns into geometry. It yeah. I am a very visual thinker, very visual spatial person, and I can imagine shape in my mind and it really helps if you see shape too. We'll get to that. So if you don't mind, I'm going to continue just a little bit. So you want to think STEAM, not STEM. STEAM, everyone. Administrators, STEAM, uh -huh. EAM, EAM. Uh -huh. The A matters. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics all require creative thinking, problem finding and solving, analysis, abstract thinking, multidimensional perception, system construction, and metacognition. But music and the arts also require those things. In fact, I dare say that the arts may be the chemical binding agent, let's use some scientific terminology, the, there, the glue <laughs> for STEM that develops these ways of thinking in the most holistic and active way. There you go. The who. So, it integrates seven styles of learning, plus some, but it especially caters to the neurodivergent and kind of visual spatial learner. Okay? So, We'll create stuff together. Thank you so much for being here. So good to see you. We're almost done here. Through adaptive and additive teaching tools, teaching and tools, the method has the capacity to scale creative music learning to every age, from elementary students to adults. We can make it work for everyone. There is a way. The method's resources have a wide variety of applications that help prepare 21st century learners with transferable skills that are interdisciplinary and life serve. This is in a packet, feel free. The method, I think, is rooted in understanding the fundamentals of music literacy. It is interdisciplinary. It uses applied literacy. It's interactive and adaptable. It's geared towards creative thinking, and it's applicable to all instruments. That's in that little pamphlet there, too, I think. And my philosophy, and the notes method philosophy, is that every person is a capable creative, has the capacity to understand and engage with music theory, can develop musical intellect and engage musical thinking, can learn interdisciplinary skills such as multidimensional perception, problem finding, visualization, 
thinking outside of the box, and creativity. And everyone benefits positively from learning music. So what can you do to help? Try the resources. You can ask me for assistance. You can suggest things based on need. Something that worked, something that didn't work. I need something for my classroom. What is it that you need? How can we find a solution? Keep learning yourselves. Keep on learning. Search for those connections, not just in music, but across the disciplines too. Because if you're doing that and modeling that for your students, they will follow. That creates a natural environment. If I make a chemistry comment in music class, that can be perfectly normal. Like these balls over here. One second. There are... Let's draw H2O as music, shall we? H2O. We can use these in science class. What does H2O sound like? Because it's a perfectly normal environment to have, and then you could mix the two, right? You could have a rain stick going along with D and F. And you could put it in whatever key you want, so it could be F sharp too, but let's say F on the basic level, C scale. Ds and two Fs, and then have them use something else that involve the color opens up, I think, their world, their creative world, because so much of what we experience is in color. <laughs> Suddenly the trees they're seeing outside, those, are, those could be music. What does that sound like? I asked a college student, you'll see this on the testimonials page of, of my website, what does gravel sound like? And he said, we drilled on that idea for three months and he created a beautiful thesis. What does gravel sound like? Like, who asks that question? Kids might ask that question, and I ask that question. So if we ask seemingly bizarre questions like that, that actually put weird two and twos together, you're making incredible connections in a way that models students finding ways for music to be applicable to all of these other things. Yes? I was just going to say, because, um... I do the C scale with the solfege to get mainly to get the kids oriented to sound in their head voice. But now to start to implement your method, I'm considering putting the color, the little creature, mm -hmm. next to the pitch. That sounds great. And then I could segue from okay, we do do me so me do, and then putting that, putting the colors on the staff, and then hopefully they'd be able to transfer that. To yes. start with more literacy. Does There's that, something I want to share about the staff. Does that make sense? Yes. The staff is actually a repeating shape. Mm -hmm. So it's an ongoing sequence. Here's an example of my staff. Mm -hmm. Which now makes some sense because there's color. C, E, G, B, D, F, A, C. E, G, B, D, F, A, C. E, G, B, D, F, A, C. Right? This is the staff. Okay. It creates a shape. Now let's connect C with C and roll it up on itself. Let's connect C with C and roll it up on itself. We know this is the rule of octaves. I'm just showing how octaves work. So C goes with C, goes with C, goes with C. You grab that off, that's off. Awesome. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. It. And it's become what? a seven-pointed star. It's become a seven-pointed star. Now, you could say, what is a clef? Okay, C, E, G, B, D, right? Or let's do treble clef, E, G, B, D, F. It's like a stamp. And you go, stamp five of those lines, starting from E. Oh, but now, what about bass clef? That starts with G. Start on G, that's your first line. Stamp five of those lines. I'd like to find a way to invent this actual stamp, almost like a, a rolling pin, uh, like a pizza pin, so that they don't get ink on themselves, but a way to kind of roll the lines onto their paper themselves. Or they can draw it. Use the colored pens. I hope you took some. They're free. Um, and draw a stamp. Use it to highlight music. So 
you can find all seven clefs from this shape. And that's what this worksheet is for, to remind you. And then I have a practice worksheet online where you can have the students practice that. Now let me use this real quick to show you how to teach the staff, or clefs, sorry, how to teach clefs in 30 seconds. Here's a great way to do that. Ah, where's my box of stuff? Oh, yeah. I hope one of these Eskimo lenses works. Let's do what we just did. Sorry, uh, can everybody see this even though I'm on the floor? Yep. I don't know if the camera can see this, but that is fine. Let's draw little notes C, D, E, F, G, A, and B. Let's draw them. I would do this in color, but just for the sake of time. In a circle. Now, have your students go, okay, we're drawing treble clef. This is, what, this is where treble clef starts. Now skip through your circle. Where so that's line one and line two, line three, line four, line five. Where the lines end, the spaces begin. Base F A C E F. I a, would ask you C, line one to the left. E. So we have to skip in forward order. Forward so in terms of the alphabet. E in terms of the alphabet. Okay. Right. Correct. And then, I, yeah, and you went to F because that was the next one. No, E-G. No, I know, but when you got through the five, you went to F because that was next available. Yeah, you so just, you just systematically going. skip through it. So we'll do that again. Starting on E, skip over F and go to G. Skip five. over A and go to B. You're line skipping. Line you're going, line notes. yeah, line notes line to notes. draw the staff. How do you name and you're the going lines? Through the alphabet. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're yeah. going through the alphabet through skips, which is really third intervals, right? E, G, B, D, F. Five lines. When you're done with five lines, that's where the spaces begin. The F is also your first space. F, A, C, E. And you close the shape. I have, I have a little video on YouTube of, of a six-year-old doing this. And it had helped them, because if they ever forget, even on an exam or something, like you could be older and use this. Oh, what's that? Right? So I remember the picture of treble clef being over here and then bass clef being over here and alto clef being over here. How, would you, how would you do alto? Because I'm a visual learner. But how would you do alto clef? F, A, C, E, G. Five lines. And your spaces are G, B, D, F. Okay, but it doesn't mean C. Sure it does. Alto clef. F. A, C is the middle line, right. okay. E, G, okay. and then spaces, G, B, D, F. This works for students like me. And then I don't have to remember my mnemonics. Yeah. Right, like, whereas like, I would be able to then, because it wouldn't work as much for me, so you'd be right. able to help me with mnemonics. So. Yeah. Right, this will help another type of learner that isn't quite getting it that way, yeah, right? Yeah. That was me, and I was like, I don't remember, and I feel dumb. Right? I just really didn't like that feeling. So this is a way that worked for me and has worked for many of my students. So that's a quick and easy for a certain type of learner, right? But that's the whole point. Let's find ways to help different types of learners. One of many, and I feel free to, I know it's sort of over now, but to explore a little bit, you can take anything here that interests you like in, in any of these, like if you want one of the worksheets. Um, feel free to take that. This I'm starting to write a music theory method book and workbook. Yeah, I'm starting so off cool. for the for the little <laughs> ones, like a level one. Uh, we're starting off, so it tells you the note names and color wheels. And if you notice, I put pictures in with the words. <laughs> yes, exactly. It can help. You need to be able to understand it in that level first. Exactly, and I need to. Right, we need some teacher training, right? We need to know but, what... But in, in a very, I mean, I feel like we get so erudite. I need to know like that. I need to be able to teach it to that right. level first, and then I can right. respond. I have, I have a, 
On my website, there's a fundamental for adults. It goes through some of that, too. Um, there's also notes for kids. Start, learn in whatever way you want. I will continue to update it as, it, as I can, you know, as much as I can. But this will help. This takes you through introducing the notes. There's a notes family song. So they can learn the notes if they're auditory. Hi, my name is No Red C. I'm married, my love yellow E. Our colors mixed for orange D. Then we brought home blue baby G. Notes family, C E G D. Notes family, C E G D. When E needs help with baby G, she asks Green Grandpa F to read and Purple Auntie A to feed. While Pet Pink Pink curls up to C. Notes family, there lives happily. Notes family sings musically. There's C E G D F A B and C. Pitch of the note. Like you put a little one. Like yes. For the little ones, for the very little ones, that that works well. There's a piano version, piano reduction. I used to introduce when I was student teaching. When I did the teaching um, in her classroom, I would I would play that on the piano as the welcome song, mm -hmm. and then they would sit down, and then we could we could learn it together. There's a rhythm dance, learning through moves. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to update a lot. So, like I said, feel free to explore. We have music theory games for slightly more upper levels, but you could use it at any level. It uh, comes with chips, colored chips with the notes. Okay. And I've invented two games already. More to come with the same kit. Buy a kit and go, All right? Unfortunately, I can't give away the kits yet because they took literally so many hours to make my hand. Um, but any one of the worksheets feel free to take, okay? And if they're, if they're not kicking me out, feel free to come up here and try the last big reveal. I have to be very careful because this is a prototype and it's, I'm hoping to have it patented. Okay. The actual staff as a musical instrument, a digital instrument. Imagine one of these on kids' desks. And Get it. What it was play it. You touch it and it plays. Okay. okay. So we're gonna, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. <laughs> this, you can play in any key, in any clef. There, you can teach the lines and spaces. You don't even need an instrument anymore. This becomes one. So if they can't figure out what note that line is supposed to be, play the player staff. P-L-A-Y-U-R staff. <laughs> right? Awesome. Like the kids would write it. Play your staff. So that's... Let's see. If you we, made that. I... Yes, it, this is a prototype um, that I invented, and we're working on it so that we can get it to the manufacturing stages and out to classrooms. So you can buy kits, kind of like Mickey Mickey. To get that trademark and all that. Yeah, I need to. I need to get. I'm working with a unregistered, unregistered trademark right now, but um, the the player staff I'm hoping to patent to we'll actually to, produce and patent. We'll be able to buy it and, and yes. on Amazon or something. Yes. Oh, wow. And there's a version of the uh, Chroma Wheel. That is the next iteration I'm going to be working on. Turn this into a physical, playable musical instrument. Wow. Then you can turn the notes. You can play melodies. You can play harmonies. You can build chords. And it fits in the back. Now you're working with an engineer, or that's just all you? That's just all me. Wow. And then I'm, I'm trying to outsource some help. I'm finding some help. Mm -hmm. um, now, because obviously I don't have all of the skills to actually get to that point. But let me show you a recent uh, player stuff. Let's just try it. So it's just plug and play. This actually comes off. This is just a piece of paper. On this board I made for it, just because it holds it a little bit more together. I don't know if it'll, if you can see, well, let's turn on a, a speaker so that Apparently, it's not it's not playing through the system. So I'm gonna try to this. Do you have to change the um? Not that this well. What right speakers now, is coming out? Um, for right now, in the, when this is done, it'll have an independent speaker. Oh, I you see. you won't have to connect it to a computer unless you want to. It'll turn okay. into a MIDI instrument. But right now, for this version, I don't. I it doesn't have a built-in speaker, so I have to connect it to something that does. Let's see if I can. Sure. 
I understand, but you wanted to play what's on the board, right? I just, I want you to be able to interact with it, but it's not. Did you have a suggestion? What do you think? No, my suggestion would be um, sometimes when you go, uh, just like, where, where would that come out of? You have to go to your, uh, I do this in school. Like, which speaker system is it coming Let's out? try through the HDMI. Let's try that, and then maybe it'll work. Oh, put the mute on. Put the mute is on. The mute is on. Yeah. No, that's that's not. I'm actually using. There we go. Yeah, it does play through the speaker. C D C D C D. Can you raise it up for me? I can't because it's connected to this. Well, we can go up and look, right? But please come up and try. So this is the singing staff that is the player. This is the player staff. Yeah, and you just touch it. You just touch it. You can also put little notes on it and have them actually spell out and build music. You can put notes on it and touch those. Feel free, just touch. What do you call this? It's the player staff. Player prototype. Oh, it's just this one, two, three, four, five, right? Right now it's set to to C scale, right? E G B D F. Yes. Um, no, it will when you can change key, but right now there's two buttons where you can make it go a, a semitone up. So let's do this. So C C sharp E G B D F or F G B D sharp or flats. Two <laughs> buttons, you do semitone up, semitone down, and you can have the kids understand that, that you're just altering the notes to be a half step higher, a half step lower, mm -hmm. unless you preset it to a key. Right? And these are the spaces here? Those are the spaces. And they'll, they'll be able to identify them. Identify, and there's a shape to it, see? So the lines pop out, and the spaces are actually spaces in between. Oh, well, right. Let's go when this thing is ready. Yeah. yeah. We've got it out. Yeah, is there any way we can even reach? Please feel yeah. free to connect with me. Yes, on the website. Oh, okay. I think. I think.